So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, for today, we have a lot of fun stuff I want to cover. We want to continue with the whole idea of optimizing and really being able to evaluate different things from the model, but get a little more sophisticated about what we're evaluating from the model. So we've been doing pretty simple stuff, stuff that we really didn't need a model to evaluate, things that were kind of very easy computations, you know, just based on a few different parameters, you know, like length and width and height and things that we really didn't need Revit to go ahead and help us with. Today, we're going to dive in and really go a little bit further. We're going to go through and really look at actually pulling values out of the model, which can really only be computed from the unusual geometry in the model, really using Revit as the calculation engine, and then start to try and get a little more sophisticated about using that. First, just grabbing some values, then saying, what if we want to try and go through and grab a couple different values, then maybe even thinking about computing ratios between two different values we're getting from the model to compute some sort of an efficiency ratio. So something that will help us figure out really of all these different options we're testing, we're testing different things, really which ones are best. And best is really a very loaded question because best is really, you know, the heart of the issue is really what is best. And depending upon what it is we're trying to optimize, we can come up with a whole lot of different bests and think about really how we start trading them off. If we're looking at two or even three different values, it gets to be very interesting about how you go through and choose either to add those together or multiply those together or come up with some diagram and figure out the area within the diagram. There's a lot of different ways we can go after trying to optimize multiple different values or to figure out what an optimum is when you have many different inputs. As we get going, Let's just go ahead and check in on assignment three. Assignment three is out there. Again, it's due next uh, Tuesday. Um, very similar to the parametric stadium example. So just want to check in in terms of is anyone, you know, are you into it? Is anyone stumbling or having any troubles with it? Or like just, you know, just want to check in or more likely, <laughs> like it's like if people haven't gotten started yet and that's all okay. You know, it's again due next Tuesday. Raj, when are you guys having like, office hours? Probably Monday and Tuesday? Okay. Very good. Excellent. Okay. So any questions thus far on it or is it yeah, you know, mostly most likely most people haven't really gotten started. Yeah. I I started because like the local I got twenty forty six. Yes. So for example, uh, I started with five points. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you create five, because it's actually mm -hmm. uh, six, six also so then I figured, oh, no, you have to do only four, so it's a bit more work than with four. Oh, exactly. So that's one example for the first step. Oh, no. So you're quite correct. When we use the five points, which gives us the more control over the inner point of the truss, we do need to go through and uh, just remove the last item from the list yeah. before you create the spline. Yeah, so it's, it's a little more work to kind of maintain that because you always have that fifth line hanging around. And even when you go through and you try to uh, make a more of a sine wave or some sort of a function out of that fourth point, you have to kind of take the fourth point out, do some things to it, and put it back in again. So you're you're correct in that. There's a little, you know, four five points is a little harder only because that's in the middle of the uh, the, the fourth is in the middle of the range. Yeah. Yeah. So other ways we could approach it even is, you know, you could take the component that ha and change the order of the points for putting it in. So, you know, right now what we're talking about is the little truss component. If you try to use the five-point truss, uh, which sort of looks like this, there's one, two, like three, four, and the fifth point's in here. It's actually like that. So. The issue is, if we're using the five-point truss as opposed to the four-point truss, when you're making your splines, you really only want to make them out of the first four points. You have to basically get rid of the fifth point, remove it from the list. But another way to approach it could be, you could change the order, you know, to kind of juggle that around. Yeah, but it's really whatever works out. But when it comes time to sort of vary the ends of the trusses, I'm talking about that fourth point, that extreme overhang point, and trying to like uh, get some sort of wave in that. Okay. So, any other questions about it? Yes. Yes. No worries. 
What I actually did, yeah, as I was doing it, was I just took the lines and divided them into X, Y, Zs. Okay, and then I made a sine wave and divided that into the same X, Y, Zs. I didn't even loft the surface. You really don't even need to make the surface. You can just take all the X, Y, Zs and just use those as panel points. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so let me give you an example of that. Just kind of like a, we're all sharing and learning from each other. So let's go ahead and show you as I was doing it. Okay, so blah, 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 let's go to, oh, which do I want? I'll do the big one. So again, this is, uh, you know, where I took the one in terms of doing the uh, large scale version. Let me kind of zoom in on that. Hang on, I'll do it the other way. Okay, uh, let me open the Dynamo file. Open, and let me go out to where I kind of have that assignment three hanging around. So again, this is gonna be one way of doing it. The interesting thing with all these programming like things, there's so many different ways to do it. I basically, you know, built some lists. I built like a, oh, five different order um, lists with the uh, different rows, okay? Then what I ended up doing was basically uh, do that equally spaced X, Y, Z. That's just kind of break it down into what we want there. But then hang on, let me go through. I do this little thing right here. It sliced the list, basically pulling off four. And let me see if I can find where we have to pull them back together. Probably shouldn't have dove into this. Uh, doing some formula that's basically putting some sort of sine wave in there, kind of just taking, what I did was I took that line four and I just took, I divided it at line four into like 15 values and I pulled the Z off of each of those 15 values and then recomputed a new Z for each of those 15 values. Put them back into a bunch of X, Y, Z points made that into a spline, that's how you get the sine wave. Okay, and then what do I have to do to that? I basically have to basically reinsert it back in the list and I'll find out where it is. I think it goes way down here. I think I'm adding it right in there and then adding uh, equally spaced transposable. Oh no, that's, I'm sorry, that's what I'm doing when I'm putting the uh, panel points or the, uh, let me go for the other one. That's what I was doing when I was putting the truss in. I should I should practice what Raj preaches, which is to like uh, go ahead and neaten up my uh, coding after I'm done with it here, because it's not this one. Let's see if I can find which one it is. There it is. I'm basically reinserting it back into the list. So. Yeah, I have the original list of five, I go off, I make my spline that has the uh, kind of sine wave in it, and then basically I go back and reinsert index zero, one, two, putting in the new index three, and then put the last one back in there. Okay, and that's how you sort of recombine it in terms of like getting it all back together. So but just one of many ways to do it. But I think you, you are correct in that it gets a little subtle and complex. And I will be the first to admit what happens is we, we will write the assignment. We'll kind of talk about it together with the TAs. And then I'll go off and try to really do it. And then often what happens is what sounds so easy turns out to be a lot of different little steps 
in terms of making it uh, happen. And then we rewrite the assignment to kind of like uh, try and adapt it to be more realistic to what we found. But you are correct. If there's any hard part in this, it is really just this notion of pulling off that fourth line, doing what you're doing, then reinserting the fourth line. Because after that, once you have that, you know, list, you divide it into curves and all that type stuff, you don't need to lock. What you can really just do is, you know, based on all those, oh, what is it? It's, oh, where did we go in there? Sun path. No, it's not in there. You just basically, there it is. You, you take all, you, you quad, you take all those X, Y, Z values from the splines that you've transposed and you just sort of say, make quads out of them and then apply panels to those quads. Okay. Hopefully, you know, I think we'll do something similar to that today so it'll sort of make more sense. It's just sort of a really common operation. Let us go ahead then and plug into what I want to cover today. And that's really, again, taking sort of where we have been and sort of extending it a little bit further along the line of just really pushing the whole notion of optimization, really what we're doing with optimization. Because, again, if we're just using, uh, doing very simple mathematical calculations, we probably don't need Revit to do it. There are some things, though, that Revit are very, very good about doing in terms of understanding some geometry, and we want to be tapping into some of those as we start trying to do this optimization. So where we are going to start today is really just coming through and getting values for a model. And what I'm going to be getting is actually the gross floor area of an unusual shape, something that we can't just say x times y times z. It's something a little bit different. It's this parametric tower that I demonstrated early on in the class. Let me go ahead and open it up. If you want to download from the coursework uh, website, it's in session 13. Let's come on over. I'm going to go out and grab it in session 13. 13.1. Let's go for it's the parametric towers. In fact, if you want to see it, the parts right, uh, well, we'll open the part in just a second. Take a look at this thing. This is a part that I actually created really based on the whole notion of the Shanghai Tower. It's very similar in some ways. Oh, my shape's a little simpler, but the idea is I really have three different profiles. I have a base profile, which kind of looks like oh, it's almost like a guitar pick. It's a rounded triangle. There's a middle profile and there's an upper profile. And if we choose this thing, you can see we really have some different instance parameters available. We have a top height, the top rotation, top radius, mid rotation, mid height, bottom height, bottom rotation. Okay. And as we go through and change those values, we can go through and recompute the shape of the tower pretty easily. So these values, you know, we can leave them independent or we can go through and kind of tie them. I actually have two different versions in this file. I have something, if you go to just triangular mass, the one that doesn't say even twist, It'll switch on over. And in this version of it, all the values are completely independent. There's nothing linking the values together. So you can try it. Just go ahead and like uh, change the top rotation or the top height. You'll see it kind of twists, deforms. Oh, you can change that mid radius. If you want it to be bowy and kind of fat in the center, you can change that. Whatever it is. It's actually a pretty good little flexible component. The interesting thing about the tower, though, is it's actually a pretty complex form in terms of doing any sorts of calculations. Each of the different floor levels is a little bit different. None of them have square edges. They're all kind of rounded edges. It's really a pretty complicated calculation to figure out really what the floor area this is. But Revit's really good at that. So what we've done is we've taken this mass and just divided it up into mass floors and then let Revit take care of the geometry. So to do that, we just took that part. Oh, where's even the modify? Modify the mass. It's hiding under there. It's so funny because it's when my menus are compressed, it's hard for me to see where things are. Mass floors. And what I did was I just set up a whole bunch of floors, 80 different floors. Even though this tower isn't 80 floors tall, it's really only about 50 floor talls right now, because 50 floors tall because it's only 500 feet. Um, if it grows taller, it'll add new floors in. It'll just kind of keep on subdividing as things go. Okay, So up to 80 floors are available in this one. 
So as we go through, and if you change the height, for example, I change it to 600 feet or something like that, you'll see that, or the twist, any of these parameters, you'll see that this variable over here, the gross floor area, as well as the surface and the volume change, all those things are being calculated. Gross floor area coming from all the mass floors, gross surface coming from just the actual surface that it's measuring on the outside, gross volume also, so any of those things change. And what's a little bit different about this than what I did with that simple box example. In the simple box example, I just sort of assume that if the floor to floor height was 10, I could take the volume and divide it by 10 and somehow get a floor area out of that. It was kind of a very rough approximation that works for a rectangular solid, but wouldn't work for a solid like this. Okay, so you put that in there, you'll get some sort of new floor area, some sort of new surface. Okay, so we can start with just this whole notion of kind of having this tower be completely independent. So, you know, based on all the different parameters being independent, you know, the mid rotation is currently half of the top rotation. The mid height is, well, it's not quite half the top height, but we can sort of change that if you want to. So, for example, if I wanted the mid rotation to be, oh, you know, 30 degrees slower at the bottom, And kind of speed up after a certain height, I can do that. Yeah, you know, I can go through and kind of tie these things together. It really depends how we want to sort of structure it. So one thing we did just to make it a little bit easier to work with is we can actually just use Revit to link the different values together. So for example, if we were modeling the Shanghai Tower, I'd change it just a little. What happens with the Shanghai Tower is the Shanghai Tower actually has a fairly constant rotation to it. Okay, It also has a fairly constant taper to it, just going top to bottom. There's sort of, it, it doesn't sort of bow in and bow out. It kind of tapers up and down relatively constantly. And if we would like to introduce anything like that, all we really have to do is, if you go through and say that you want to edit the type, or not edit the type, excuse me, Let's choose the mass and edit the family. You'll get back to the original family definition, and we can link some of the different parameters together. So let me go to just kind of the default 3D view on this instead. That perspective view is a little funny. But if I choose the family type and I get the parameters, you'll see here's sort of uh, the default parameters. I can start linking them together. For example, if I wanted to go through and have, oh, the rotations be related, let's say, for example, the top rotation was some value we put in. If I want the mid rotation to be half of that, just so that it doesn't get out of sync, what I can do is just change that to a formula. I'll say, let's make that this top rotation divided by two. Okay. Let us link it together. In this case, yeah, looks about the same. If I go through and try putting in a different rotation, like 120, and say apply that, hopefully it'll change to 60. Okay, it'll sort of be a little smarter about that. So you can think about whether you want to have independent rotation and keep moving together. Same thing in terms of just the, the taper. We could say that, oh, let's see, if the base radius is 80 and the top radius is 60, we could say that we want the mid radius not to snag in. That's like making a, a belt point in the center of it. I could go ahead and relate those two things together. So I could say that, oh, the mid radius is going to be, let's say it is oh, uh, the top radius. What do I want it to do? If I want to do that, I want to make it halfway between. Let's say top right now. It depends if I'm going up or down. <laughs> yeah, minus uh, top radius. That's the difference. In my mind, I'm thinking this is wrong. Base radius. <laughs> and 
Now, that's clearly wrong in terms of what's going on. It's top. I need to add that back in. Uh, uh, the way I've done it, I'd have to basically subtract it off. It's, it's funny. I, it's funny. When I'm doing bad math, I can tell I'm doing bad math because uh, my brain's just not awake yet this morning in terms of doing that. What do I want it to do? I really want it to just be the middle of those two different things. So, oh, I know. I'll just add them together and divide by two. That'll work. Otherwise, if I subtracted the difference, I should add it to the base or whatever it is. This will actually work whichever way is the biggest. Okay. So just the average of those two. So whether the top's big or the bottom's big, hopefully that'll be in the center of the two. Okay. Sort of make sense? Actually, wouldn't it have been bad? We could have done the same thing in terms of the, uh, the well, we could even do that to the height if we want to. We could say that the height always has to be you know, halfway between the top and the bottom or something like that. So if you want the mid heights to always be, oh, we could make that the top heights divided by two. We can put that in there too. We have something that's going to be very... Uh, but controlled. See what again? You don't have to do this. It's just if you sort of want to have kind of a very controlled movement as you change different things. Okay, because really what I want to do is just try changing a few things about the tower. I could try changing the height. That would be kind of interesting. What I'm actually going to be playing around with today is the whole notion, notion of uh, changing the twist. Okay, because that's kind of an interesting one. Yeah, that's a little harder to kind of get your head around. But we're going to try changing that. So I'd like the whole shower, tower to flex smartly relative to that. Yes? If you go in and change the values yes. of those towers that actually have a formula as well, yes. will they obey the formula in any of this? This is actually kind of an interesting issue. And I always have to kind of play with this to kind of make sure. Because it's, you know, will it drive it in both directions is sort of the interesting issue. So if you put 300 in there instead of 250, okay. Will it do, and it, it does, it, it's, it's driving, it drives in and drives out, either way. So if I change the mid height, since that relationship will be maintained, it'll try to drive the top height. Okay, there's sort of an interesting one here about this whole notion of locking, where you can sort of stop that yeah. in terms of like uh, which way the directionality of the behavior works. But yes, it's, it'll do its best to try and maintain the constraints. Okay. So I got this tower. It's got a little bit of an even twist. It's kind of doing okay. If you want to go through and load that one into your project, super. Because all that'll do is it'll give you a little more control over the tower. Or if you haven't done that, just switch over to, there's a tower called Even Twist. I kind of made one earlier that had uh, some of this encoded into it. Okay, and just to test it to make sure, give it a try. So if you say that top rotation is 120, for example, let's see if that thing flexes around. Okay, if I, it's hard to tell the difference there. Let's say that top radius is something much smaller, like 20 or something like that. Really give it a taper that we can see. So it looks like it's doing pretty good. The important thing is it's sort of a complex form. So we're going to need a little like a help to go through and uh, do the calculations with it. Okay. So the idea is we have this form. We'd like to play with this form. We'd like to go testing some things about it. And what we're going to try testing is really just, oh, if we're going to go through and try just tweaking the amount of rotation there, let's go ahead and see really what effect that has, you know, on the, uh, like, gross floor area, or we could do it on the surface area, either one of those things, or ultimately we're going to do it to both. And to do that, what we're going to do is open up Dynamo, and let's just kind of think about the overall flow of the logic. So if you open up under session 13.1, Let's go ahead and find my little uh, starting point. Looks like that one. I don't even have a starting point. I just have the uh, final one that does it. Okay, let's take a look and see how we can approach this. Okay, 
it all starts out with this notion of uh, just really what we were doing before. We're selecting a family instance, we're choosing a variable that we want to do some change to, and then we're choosing some parameter that we want to report. I include a parameter that was really just a text string indicating what type of value we're pulling out, only because as it's reporting back the values, there's a scaling factor that we need to throw in there. It's a correction just for the issue of is it an area, a length, or is it a volume? Okay, and a place to go ahead and temporarily write the values. This again is just an iterator. This is going through and just setting up a range of values we want to iterate through. So for right now, it looks like what I'm telling it is take the top rotation and iterate between 20, loop on through up until we get to the value of 60. So I'm not doing recursively. I'm just doing this kind of as 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Okay. Let me go ahead and up here, let's make sure we have the uh, correct family chosen. Okay, and that's my one that has even twist on it, that's fine. Again, if I need to, I can say change and choose the family instance that I wanna be controlling. Okay. And then in terms of what goes on, all the magic really happens inside this get rev up model parameters. And if we take a look at that node and edit the custom node, you'll see that what that's going to do is just given all those different input values, it's going to start by just setting the element parameter. So for the family instance, it's going to change the parameter to change. In this case, that's going to pass in the radius. Okay. It's going to set that run a transaction, that's gonna get it to sort of put it into Revit and make the change. And the second thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna get the element parameter. And it's gonna get the value that we're trying to extract and again, post that as a transaction. Okay, then we're gonna just take that value, multiply it by a scaling factor and write it out as a string. So write it out as a little comma separated value string. We'll take the input value, comma, the output value, and then write it out as a string, and put that all together in a little string file. So that's the idea behind this function. It's gonna perform them all in that order. So let's go ahead and take a look at that and see how it works. So the idea is we're gonna go through and put in some different values here, you know, for the rotation. We could have put in a height or something like that. We would do that just by changing this to be the top height. We're gonna put in a rotation. Okay. One little variation that I want to warn you about that we need to do is as follows. And let me kind of take it out first and show you what the effect is. And then we'll kind of put it back in there and show you what the effect is. Okay. As we go through and run this and we put in these values 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, okay, you think things are going to happen very nicely in the background there. So let's go ahead and get ready to run that and see what happens. Okay, what I want to do is, I'm just trying to set up my little Revit window so you can actually see things happening in the background here. I like to select that. That way I can see the uh, values in the properties palette changing as it's going through and doing its iteration. There's just not enough screen real estate to make it all happen. So I'll go ahead and say run. And let's see what happens. You'll see it's going through and doing some interesting things to our tower. It's actually doing some very interesting things to our tower back over there. I told it to go through and put in a radius of like, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. And it's doing something a little bit different than I expected over here in top rotation. It's going from a radius of 11.45 point, or a rotation of 11.45.916 to even more extreme values. And if we want to go through and kind of take a look at, like, this is what it decided the value should be. Yeah, Natasha. Oh, no worries. What we will do is, we will just put a, a little text file somewhere on your machine, on your desktop, and then point to it. So what you need to do is, what I do is I'll do this. I'll come out and I'll just add on the desktop, I'll say new, oh, just give myself a text document. There it is over there. Let me give it a name. 
I'll say session 13. I tend to give it very simple names, like no spaces or anything, because it seems to be happier when I do that. Okay, so I just gave it a new just a data file, kind of hanging out there on the desktop. Then what I'll do is back over in Dynamo. Um, choose the file path and just go out to your desktop and find that. Okay, and again, that's just kind of a, a little temporary point to store the data values. Okay, and that should actually let you do that. Okay, in terms of what it actually returned, let's go through and take a look at what the little file looks like that it created. Yeah, I have this node, which actually shows me what the values were. You'll see that I went through and I put in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It sort of reported that right. It seems like it got the values okay in terms of what's going on over here. But somewhere along the way, it sort of really kind of did something odd in that if I go choosing this, okay, you'll see that it actually has a rotation of 1145.916. Okay, here's what's going on as best I can figure out. We have the issue of basically inputting things as degrees or inputting things as radians. Okay, and what it's done, if you go through and try to calculate it all through, it's taken 20, which I wanted to be degrees, and made it into 20 radians. So it went through and kind of constructed, uh, you know, kind of something much more, put a lot more rotation in it than I wanted to. In terms of figuring out really the number of radians we really want, Here's what you got to remember about radians. Okay, as you go moving around the circle, okay, that is two pi radians. Okay, so if you want to go through and have 20 degrees, okay, what you really need to do is come up with a ratio that looks like this. You need to basically say you want 20 over 360, okay, times two pi. Okay, and that'll sort of basically get you to the same point in terms of computing the number of radians. Okay, so what we had to do, just to go through and make sure that our tower doesn't go twisting around, it's kind of amazing it could twist that much. Okay, we go through and just sort of change the input values ever so slightly. What we'll do is down here, say, hey, let's not go ahead and just put in the raw 20, 30, 40, 50. Let's go ahead and take those values and really what I'm doing is dividing the number of degrees, okay, by 180 times pi. Okay, so what am I really trying to do? I'm just basically trying to figure out the number of radians. Okay, so, yeah. If I did that, right, the radians is equal to that, and divided by 2 pi, okay. So I need to divide by 180 by pi. It will go through and make that happen. So what this will do is go through and just compute. As I move through 20, 30, 40, 50, it will figure out that it's basically you know, 0.34 radians, 0.52 radians, 0.69 radians, and things like that. Okay, So that's what's really happening there. So what we need to do is say that, hey, for our input values, let's not go ahead and plug in just 20, 30, 40. What we'll go through and plug into the function instead is these factored ones, okay? And that'll just sort things out a little bit. <laughs> okay, if you have that, go ahead and put that in place. Let's go ahead and do a little run to it. It'll go through and recompute. Hopefully this time you'll see that as it's going through and doing its evaluation, 20, 30, 40, it's kind of returning reasonable things over there. Great. Okay. Let's talk about what it's returning and where it's stopping. So the idea is we can go through and just grab these different values. It's not hard to grab the different values. We get this lovely little comma-separated text file, a comma-separated comma value text file that just shows us, now it's reporting the number of radians, but it's also reporting, what is it, uh, to say the gross floor area for each of these different values. 
And you can see that for the 20 degree or 0.34 radians, it's uh, basically 203,000, 205,000, 207,000, all the way up to 210. So as we're going through and increasing the twist, we're actually increasing the floor area. Okay. In terms of really what we do with that data, okay, it's really just a value that's been reported. You know, we can start to think about, well, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to maximize the floor area? Are we trying to minimize the floor area? We could really go through and choose whatever we want to do. We might want to even sort of take a look at really what happened. As I went from 20 to 50, it went through and it looks like it's growing. You know, I'm sort of wondering if we go from 20 to 50 to 90 to more than 90, does it keep growing or does it actually start decreasing again at some point? Is there some local high or local low in this sort of equation? And honestly, I don't have a really good intuitive sense about that. Yeah, you know, I suspect there probably will be one, but I don't really know. But there's no harm in going through and testing it. So let's go ahead. It's all about exploring the forms. So let's say if instead, since this was pretty quick, we went from 20 to, oh, actually, you can always drag the slider or what I often do. Is I'll just go ahead and kind of put in values like that. So yeah, I'm going to go to the full 180. Okay, let's see what the impact of that is. You know, is there actually a local high or a local low or what it is or where we might think the maximum value might be? Let me go ahead and run it and we'll see. So again, cycling through in the background, you can see over here, it's going through one iteration at a time. Calculating all those different things for each of those things, returning the gross floor area. And let's see if we can actually figure out what's going to happen. Okay, coming past the curve with 90. Not doing so bad. Interesting, the volume's changing too. I was keeping my eyes on that. It didn't look like it was changing too much. But what we're going to go through is compute some values. We're going to look at a single value, but we really could be grabbing as many different values as are interesting to us at each of these different points. Okay, we're up through 180. That's looking pretty good. It's going back. Okay, it went back to 20. Let's see what it's doing. Okay, if I go to the results and take a look at perform all, Kind of take a look at that file. Actually, you can sort of see, I even have a little watcher set up on it so we can kind of check out the values over here. We can see that as it moves all the way from zero to 3.14159, which sounds an awful like 180 degrees. Okay, it's going from 203 to 12 to 20 to 26 to 25 to 23 to 16. So it actually looks like it does peak out at some point. Okay, so up to a certain degree of rotation, we're increasing the floor area. After we increase or pass something, it's going past it. If you actually want to sort of see what those variations are, like we have a big list. We've returned a big list of values, and the rest of this function is the part that goes through and says, hey, given a list, find the max, find the minimum. And that part of the function is just hanging out over here. We can say, Let's go ahead and take that CSV list, and I'm going to basically break it into what I call a hierarchical list. That's a list of lists. So what's happening in this node is it's just taking that text string. And for each of those different rows of data, it's returning a list for each of the rows, which is the test value and the value that's been returned. And from that, it's pulling off Oh, we can pull off the first column, the second column, okay. Or what I did in this function, get extreme column values, is just to find the highest and the lowest. So I can find the highest value, the lowest value. What's happening here in our scripting ultimately is I'm taking the, the input value for the minimum and feeding that back in and setting the value to that. So the way this is structured, the final element is set to match the minimum. If instead I wanted it to match the maximum, so maximize the value instead, 
I would grab here, sort of say basically, instead, feed it the maximum value. Let me run that again and kind of show you what it'll do. It'll then, it'll go through the uh, data, and at the end of the data, it'll go through and set the actual element in Revit to the correct value. In fact, it already did it there because it didn't need to re go through and recompute all those things. You'll see that the rotation at the maximum value is actually 130, which looks something like that. Now, interesting little factoid, just yeah, along the way as we did this. Yeah, does anyone know what the degree of rotation is for the Shanghai Tower? It's actually 120 degrees. And they looked at optimizing a lot of things. They were really trying to optimize the structural weight of all the elements in it. They were optimizing, you know, the wind directionality and what the wind forces were going to be on it. Yeah. They, in, in wind tunnel testing, they actually thought that even going up to 180 degrees would be a more favorable shape, but that actually started being very difficult structurally to go through and accommodate that much twist. So they backed it off to 120 as their optimum. So I think it's interesting that Somewhere around 120 is kind of an, uh, it's an interesting point in terms of what's going on. Okay, so we can go ahead and pull this out for a single value. And if we can pull it out for a single value, we can start pulling out multiple values. And that's really the next step. But before we do that, let's just go ahead and make sure we understand where some of these different nodes down here are getting their values and see how that's all feeling to you. So, it all starts with this notion of writing the comma separated value file, stuff like that, just sort of basically taking all those values and stringing them together, value, comma, value. So let me just kind of check in with you on that. Does that feel pretty good in terms of how that's happening? Okay, just writing the strings out. Okay, next thing is basically converting that list into these hierarchical lists. And by for doing that, we have a custom node we set up that just converts the text into lists. And again, how we do that, is fairly straightforward. We go through and edit that. So you can sort of see how what's inside of it. What we're doing is we're just basically splitting up strings row at a time. We have a couple of different things. We have a carriage return that we split things into. The carriage return is basically just breaking it into rows of data. And that's how you actually put in a carriage return. It's just a big, it's literally a carriage return. Okay, as a string of text. So we split it based on that. Okay, then based on how many different rows of data, we can get the list length, that'll figure out how many data rows are kind of hanging around in there. I have a little if in there based on the notion of is there a string of text at the beginning or is there a data value in the first row? That just tells me if there is a header, start looking at row one as opposed to looking at row zero for data. That just sort of tells me where to start looking for data. Okay. But it's basically, let's go through that list uh, from the you know, starting point to however many items are in the list of valid data. And then it goes through and gets each of those things. So it gets a row at a time, splitting the row by, based on a comma. So what it's going to do is just return like all the different little individual values. And then what we're going to do is just basically take those data values, you know, convert them from strings to numbers, okay, and just split all the values out, putting them in a separate little pieces of a list. So that's how, you know, when it goes through and on every row there's value one, comma, value two, it just puts one second list item is item two. It just kind of breaks it up like that. Okay, once you have that, we can do all these different little get values from the list. All that really says is given that you've given me a list, you know, go ahead and pull out the value of column one or zero for the zero basis. Zero would be the first value. One would be the second value. The mapping function just says given a list, go ahead and return all those values. So if I give it zero, it's returning all the first column. If it's giving you one, it's returning all the second column. Okay. And this final function over here, just getting the extreme values, that says, great, given that you know how to get a value from column one, you know how to get values out of column two, can you do this? Basically take the list, okay, 
basically take another column, which is the column you're trying to find the extreme value on. In our case, we're trying to find the extreme value in column one, and then just return the high and the low. And the high and low is just based on that list, we go through and find values and sort the values based on the value in that column. Then I basically find the first and the last to get the high and the low values. So again, it's a lot of little logic in there. I think a lot of that little logic, it's good to go through and you know, unpack and sort of experiment with a little bit yourself. But you know, at some level, you can just kind of consume the node and use it. It will go through and return a high and a low given a string of values. Okay, so let's pause there for a second. Okay, so in general, how is this feeling in terms of this notion of iterating through a bunch of different things and it's finding that high value or finding the low value in there? Because I want to sort of make sure this is resonating before we go to the next step, which is to start, you know, kind of complicate it by adding some more variables in here. So, yes, no, maybe? I, I'm, getting a, I'm getting a maybe face over here. Oh, no worries. How about for you guys? Is that sort of feeling okay, more or less? So how about for you? Is it kind of generally okay, or what do you think? Yeah? You okay? Yeah. Hong? Alan? Okay. Okay. If, if, yeah. I want to make sure that yeah, we're, we're catching, uh, yeah, understanding this part. What we're going to do now is just kind of continue to build on it in a very systematic way. Okay. But it really is based on this and just this whole notion of iterating through and grabbing different values. But the same infrastructure of going through and putting all the values in text file, then getting that text file and grabbing all the values into different columns and then choosing a column that we're going to go through and evaluate based on, that's going to be very common. Okay. So the next item, then if we want to kind of proceed down the list, is say, okay, great. We did this looking at the notion of really grabbing this one value, okay? This one value, which is the gross floor area. Yeah. The question is, how could we go ahead and change this around to go through and grab two different values and maybe even do something with those two different values like compute an efficiency or some sort of ratio between those? Okay, and so to do that, Let's go ahead and close this up. We're going to open a slightly different example. It's going to look pretty much the same in terms of the example we're working with. Go ahead and open up 13.2. That'll look amazingly like 13.1 because it is pretty much the same model file but we're gonna go through and do something a little bit different. Let's go ahead and open the add-in. And how about this? Let's go ahead and have you open up, it's actually the finish point. So 13.2, go to the part that says 13.2, the end. Let's start with that. Let's just kind of run it first and sort of get a sense of what it's going to do. And then based on that, we'll go back and rebuild it. Okay. So this scripting is very similar to the last scripting. Some of the few differences are that as opposed to going through and just picking out the gross floor area, I'm actually also going to add in a second parameter report, in this case, gross surface area. I'm going to grab them both. Okay. And based on that, we're going to modify our function over here so that as opposed to just grabbing the single value and putting it into a comma separated list, we're going to grab the second and the third value. We're going to grab three different values and put them in a list and make that happen. Let's go ahead and just run it, see what's going on. Oh, let's run that from like 20 to, I'll do it to 90 now. Often as I'm testing things, I'll just sort of put smaller little increments in there because you don't need 12 values to figure out your function's not working. Two or three is usually enough to kind of figure out that it's not working. It'll save you some time. 
So let's let it rip. So again, we'll start with 20. The input value side's just the same. I'm still just going 20, 30, 40, 50. That's not changing at all. The only difference is this time, I'm gonna go through and pull out two different values instead. Okay, it's kind of doing its work in the background over there. Looks like it may be done. Okay, if I look at the values that are being reported now, I can take a look at that watch which is set up. You'll see now there's actually two different things being reported here. There's the input values in radians, followed by the growth floor area, followed by the growth surface area. So now I have like three different values on each of the different rows. Okay, and out of that, we're basically gonna go say, great, given that I have these three different values, you know, how do I consider an optimum based on both those different values? Okay. Let us, before we dive into that though, let's go ahead and take a break now for five minutes for anyone who wants to get up and stretch, grab some water, come on back, okay? And when you do, we will go through and uh, just look at how we had to adjust the scripting, which was pretty minimally, to go through and pull out a second value in addition to the first value, okay? So let us pause for a second and we'll come right back.